Good evening and welcome to Current Issues. I'm your host, Hisham Tilawi. Welcome to the second hour, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to talk about Mother Earth. And we apologize for the sound in the first hour as uh, that's the best we can get from the source. So uh, hopefully you were able to get at least few of what Khaled Amira was talking about. In its four and a half billion years, Earth has evolved from its hot, violent birth to the celebrated watery blue planet that stands out in pictures from space. In a new book to noted University of Washington astrologist, astrobiologist, say the planet already has begun the long process of devolving into a burned out cinder eventually to be swallowed by the sun. The disappearance of our planet is still seven and a half billion years away, so don't worry, don't start packing. We got plenty of time. But people really should consider the fate of our world and have a realistic understanding of where we are going. That's what Donald Brownlee, one of the authors of the book that we will be discussing today, that's what he said. We live in a fabulous place at a fabulous time. It's a healthy thing for people to realize what a treasure this is in space and time and fully appreciate and protect their environment as much as possible. In the Life and Death of Planet Earth, Brownlee and University of Washington paleontologist Peter Ward used current scientific understanding of planets and stars as well as the parameters of life to provide a glimpse of the second half of life on Earth and what comes after. The life and death of planet Earth explains how the married life on Earth today was preceded by a long period of microbial dominance and the authors contend that complex life eventually will disappear and be succeeded again by a period of only microbial life. They say that the higher life will be removed much as it came into being, ecosystem by ecosystem. Aspects of the planet's past, such as numbingly cold ice ages, will be relived in the periods of devolution. If we do not begin to slide into the next glacial cycle, there probably are grand planetary scale engineering projects that might stop or lessen the effect, Professor Ward said. We have the pleasure of hosting tonight via telephone Professor Peter Ward. Thank you, sir, and welcome to the program. Well, thanks for having me. Yes, sir. So, um, what a nice view uh, and a nice future you're telling us about Mother Earth. Um, what is going to happen? Well, we, we, we did learn that you should never write a book that has such a a depressing premise. Um, that book sold probably 15 copies. No one really wanted to know about how the Earth was going to end. Uh, it's, we wrote that book five years ago, and we know so much more now than we did then. This idea that we could slide into an ice age is, you know, that's really something that's no longer on the table. And what we're really worrying about now, of course, is global warming. And I have a brand new book out called Under a Green Sky. And I'm trying to, in this book, is try to understand even better than we did in Life and Death of Planet Earth, just what are the, the problems facing us. And we can use the past, the deep past, the study of mass extinctions, to see what the worst possibilities are for our species and for our planet. 
And believe me, the past is a very grim reminder that if we don't get our act together about global warming, we've got big problems. So, the, the doctor, I, I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit confused because, number one, uh, I understood that you think the sun will swallow the earth, but at the same time, we might be going into a glacier period, which it, it doesn't uh, make sense. And number two, uh, global warming, no matter what humans are the cause of this, uh, what is coming, it's so huge and humongous than what human beings can ever do. Can you uh, explain this, this uh, 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 dilemma for me? Sure. We're really talking about different scales of time. Uh, and the long-term cycle of planets is that over time you lose your carbon dioxide. I mean, we, if we did not have this carbon dioxide in our atmosphere now, we would be so cold that the entire planet would ice over. So thank goodness that we have these volcanoes that keep pumping out all this stuff. And as we pointed out, there's, there's really two things happening. Long-term, the Earth is losing carbon dioxide, which tends to make it colder. But at the same time, the sun is getting larger, slowly, but larger, which makes the Earth hotter. So these two have been in a balance for a long time, a beautiful balancing act. But then along comes humanity, and we have added to the natural flux of carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere industry, coal, coal-fired generation. And it, we have overwhelmed the system to the point that we're rising at about two parts per million. We're at 380 parts per million CO2. Uh, the, the study of the past really suggested if we get to a thousand, some very bad things will happen. So yes, life and death of planet Earth is speaking in millions of years, but we have to worry about the next hundred years and get through that before we can even think about millions of years. So, so I mean, if, if we're thinking that this is going to be millions of years or probably billions of years away before the destruction of Earth, uh, why is it so essential that we do something for the next hundred years? Well, we want civilization to exist. Life on this planet, we can look at the various scales. We, we really have a pretty good idea that animal life, life such as ourselves, which has been on the planet for 500 million years, has about the same amount of time left. And this is, again, when carbon dioxide disappears, you can't have plant life. When plants go away, you lose your oxygen. And the reason carbon dioxide is going away is that carbon dioxide can be turned into rock, and this is limestone, and we can see coral reefs do this, clamshells do this. You can look anywhere in big mountain chains, go to the Rockies, for instance, and you see beautiful, gigantic, white limestone mountains. Well, that's all the Earth's carbon that's been tied up. Now, the rest of the planet has a, a nice cycle called plate tectonics, in which you can cycle Earth material that goes down deep. And, it melts, it comes back up again. But once we build ever bigger continents, we tie up carbon. And it's this loss of carbon through time that is going to doom animal life. So that's the irony, isn't it? It's the long-term loss of carbon that's going to wipe out animals. But it's the short-term, too much carbon, which could wipe out human civilization. Not us as a species, but our civilization, our complex. The fact that I can sit here talking on the telephone, you can hear me across part of this continent, that's an amazing civilization that could pull that off. With too much carbon, if we turn it into chaos, that I think will happen if we don't let things off a little bit, uh, this conversation won't take place. Okay, so you're saying the, the Earth atmosphere is losing carbon dioxide over time, correct? Yep, over the long period of time. And uh, for, But now, for, now, at this moment, we are creating too much carbon dioxide. Yep, this is a very short-term spike, but this spike, again, is so dangerous because carbon dioxide is so unbelievably potent. And then we're talking parts per million. There's not many of those little CO2s floating around out there, and yet there's sufficient numbers of them to allow plants to grow, thank goodness for that, and there's sufficient numbers of them to keep us warmer than we otherwise would be. But the bad news is is that because of our coal-fired plants, because of our automobiles, because of jet travel, and because we are just generating so much burning, burning of the continents of their forests, that we're seeing this rapid run-up, and that's the okay. problem. Okay. Uh, we have a lot to cover, and we're going to try to cover it in this one hour. Now, something is happening in the oceans that you think we are losing life in the oceans, where some places deep 
uh, down and the water have completely lost oxygen, which is lost uh, of life. Uh, tell me about this phenomena. How long have we uh, known about it? And what is the danger of these uh, oxygen lacking uh, uh, areas actually expanding? Well, we certainly do lose oxygen in many places. Right now, the Gulf of Mexico has gigantic areas every year that produce these oxygen free zones. The best and most famous one on the planet, the only stable one really, is the Black Sea. The Black Sea is a gigantic, it's almost like a lake, but it's a, a small sea. It's not quite oceanic in Central Asia. The Black Sea has only oxygen on top, and the rest of it, the rest of its great depth, is water without oxygen. When that happens, you produce types of bacteria that don't otherwise and cannot live in oxygenated water. In my own area, I live in Washington State. We have a very large fjord system called Puget Sound, and many areas in this Puget Sound region are turning into deep oxygen-free fjords, and the reason is that so many vacation houses have been put there that so much sewage gets pumped in that you produce life in huge quantity but so much that it dies, it rots, and in rotting it takes the oxygen out of the water, which cannot be replenished. So it is human waste and the enormous amount of fertilizer that we're pumping into our farmlands that washes down the Mississippi, each of the river systems, next to continents producing these dead zones, and the dead zones themselves are enlarging. Okay. Now, uh, your uh, partner, uh, Donald Brownlee, he's, he's on a project with NASA, something about astrophysics or something? No, it's very cool. He uh, has the stardust to have come back. He sent a mission out. He was the principal investigator of a planetary probe that went out and got a piece of a comet and brought it back to Earth two years ago now. So it was the, the farthest space probe we've ever sent out to space and brought it back with the goods. So, yeah, he's a high NASA guy. Okay. So now, what is he looking into? He wants to know about the origin of the solar system, the age of the solar system, but also the models by which our solar system formed. We'd like to know how special are we. Are we a pretty normal solar system, or could we expect that for some reason our particular system is unlike others? And there's still now, not enough information to know. Okay. Now, you're saying in your book that uh, eventually a couple of planets that are closer to the sun will be swallowed by the sun and there is a big chance that our planet will do the same thing. Do you think that's why the human race is exploring uh, this, uh, uh, space right now? So we can yeah. find other planets to probably move humanity to? Well, we will certainly have to get out of the solar system. However, that that is still seven billion years away before the sun expands to the planet. Well, by, by then we should be able to find out what's out there, correct? Well, you'd think so. <laughs> but again, I suspect that we've got some shorter-term challenges closer by that are going to make things really tough. You know, so we might not even make it to find out if we can jump into another planet and start life again, which probably that's where we came from, uh, Professor? Well, we certainly have to survive the short term if we're going to make the long term, but um, the number of us are also questioning long-term space flight. Humans don't do well in space. There is certainly no technology now that could get us to a nearby star in any sort of reason. Well, I mean, in, in about a billion years, we should be able to, right? But how do you know? Who knows? I mean, it's, it just seems we see it on TV. We see it in the movies, so just we assume that it's true. But this whole idea of faster than light drives, this idea that we could somehow freeze humans and have them wake up, um, yeah, a billion years is a long time, but there are laws in the universe that perhaps are so stringent that you can't fix them. Right? What about the chance that we never get out of our solar system, that we explore every planet within it, but that even four light years, the nearest other star systems that might have planets, are just too far, that we could never put enough people in a starship to live long enough to colonize another system. That's a distinct possibility that has never been raised, really, in the popular press. Okay. Um, I'm wondering, maybe that's why the, the Chinese are exploring space and then the Russians, and uh, I guess these advanced societies probably... Uh, in due time, they might be able to probably rapture to space somewhere, and then those who are not paying attention to space probably will remain on Earth and 
uh, become uh, dust. Well, you certainly, the, the idea now for going out into space, I think, is probably economic. I think the Chinese are very smart. There's the potential that the moon holds within it an energy source that has enormous, enormous uh, industrial potential for great wealth. This is something called helium-3. It was discovered years ago when the Apollo astronauts went up there, and there may be a new space race to the moon to actually capture and bring back this material. It's, it's a very fine disseminated material, but it would be ideal fuel for fusion reactors, which probably would be our energy source in the next century. Okay. Now, can you tell me some of the things that you see happening to Mother Earth now that would have a grave effect on uh, our life on Earth? One of the things that I wanted to ask you uh, is uh, some people are some farmers, some bees farmers, saying that their, their beehives are dying. Have you looked into that? I don't study that, but I've certainly heard enough about it, and I've heard from my colleagues how desperately important this is. The bees are being attacked by parasites and by virus, but certainly I think pesticides are playing their part as well. Um, now, what I, effect would that have on the ecosystem? Well, pollination is necessary for, for vegetables and fruit to be produced. If we have any decrease in food production, we're, we live on a knife edge with so many people on this planet. The United States produces a surplus. If, for instance, we can only just feed ourselves because we lose bees, we don't have the pollination, what happens to all the countries that are receiving surplus grain and surplus fruit? Um, you have famine. When you have famine, people go to war. National, national security on a global scale really requires that the Earth stay fed. Here is a new and very significant threat to uh, global stability. <laughs> Who would think that a honeybee, such a simple little creature, could be so important in the ecosystem of humanity? Now, any any other something else happening out there, like the honeybees uh, that is happening there? Do you know of any uh, this uh, uh, global warming effect that is really that's going to be dangerous in the next 10, 15 years? Yeah, and I want to go back to this book I've just written, The Life, or I'm sorry, Under a Green Sky. And the, the funny thing is, I can't get anybody to review it. And it, it, I think it's very important that we understand that the past mass extinctions are not something that cannot happen again. And what I did in this book is look at the situation in the past that produced huge death of species. And this, in every case, was because there was short term increase in carbon dioxide. Now, in the past, CO2 rose really quickly because of a very short-term but rare but very important events called flood basalt. So flood basalt is not a volcano, but it's a volcanic activity. It's a big crack and the earth opens up and out pours lava. Well, we see these. We have Washington State. My own state has one of these. We can find them in Oregon. There are huge flood basalts. In India, there's great flood basalts. In New York State, the Palisades, we can see them in Siberia. Each of these happened at a different time. Every time one of these happened, there was a mass extinction. Those flood basalts produced so much carbon dioxide that what we did is produce a poisonous, oxygen-free ocean. I and mean, let's think about what global warming does. Global warming heats up the poles, the Arctic, the Antarctic. It doesn't heat the equator. The equator is already so hot, it can't get any hotter. If you have a warm Arctic and a warm tropics, there's no heat differential. What does heat differential do? It's the cold Arctic and the warm tropics that produces the heat flow that makes ocean currents, that makes storms, that makes wind. A globally warm world won't be one of superstorms. It will be one where it's absolutely calm. There will be no wind. There will be no storms. And because there's a lack of currents, the ocean loses its oxygen. It needs to be agitated so that oxygen and air can get into the ocean. If you don't agitate it, you lose that oxygen. If you lose oxygen in the oceans, you produce situations where new types of bacteria take over the oceans. These are purple sulfur bacteria. We know it happened over and over in the past, and when this happened, the oceans turned bright purple. The bacteria produce hydrogen sulfide gas as a normal part of the respiration. That H2S gas is highly toxic to we vertebrate animals, highly toxic to plants. The greatest mass extinction of the past was the permanent extinction 200 million years ago. We have records now from the rocks 
of the cell walls of these purple sulfur bacteria. The Triassic extinction, 200 million years ago, same thing. Another extinction, 180 million years ago, same thing. 100 million year old, 100 million year old extinction, same thing. We see a record of a flood basalt. The oceans go anoxic. The production of dangerous hydrogen sulfide gas. Well, we don't have flood basalts now. What we have are human industry, and so. We see we are now the new flood basalt. If we warm the, the, the Arctic and stop winds, we produce anoxic oceans, the ice caps melt, and we have these bacterial takeovers. That's the biggest threat facing humanity. And wh what are we talking about here if nothing is being done about it? Are we talking about 100 years or less? Yeah, well, here's a great question. It's certainly to get to an anoxic ocean would be thousands of years. But the first part of it, just even getting close, if we melt Greenland, and the Greenland ice cap, one of the great ice caps, is melting as we speak, we see a sea level rise of anywhere between 8 and 20 feet. We only need a sea level rise of 3 feet, 1 meter, to cause about a quarter of all the deltas on the planet to be partially flooded. And the deltas are the richest agricultural areas on the planet. If you don't cover it with seawater with a 1 meter sea level rise, what you do is cause salt to rise ever higher in the river systems with every high tide. You cause the soil in those areas to become saturated with salt. They can't grow plants. There goes famine. The deltas are the great bread baskets of humanity at the moment. So many countries depend upon these. The Mississippi River Delta, the Brahmaputra, uh, the Ganges, the Nile, of course. Each of these areas that absolutely sustain humanity. An eight-foot eight sea level rise would be well, half of the country of Bangladesh disappears. You okay. not only have famine, but you have people displaced on mega scales. Hundreds of millions of people displaced by an eight-foot sea level rise. That causes warfare. Warfare is the most destructive of all ecological events. Okay. Now, uh, your new book, you said you have a problem finding someone to review it. Is that for what it, the contents of it, or is it for political reasons? Boy, that's a great question, eh? New York Times said, no, <laughs> you got me, not a single newspaper on the planet. I guess there's just so many global warming books out, and there's just there's no interest. It's kind of like I've been on this radio tour talking to many cities, and the the moderators, you know, the people such as you, say, look, we're just, people are tired of it. You know, we've been hearing about it for a year now. We just want it to go away. Well, guess what? It's not going away. And it's just one of those things where there's a new cycle, you know, you go on to the next new cycle, but this is one that's geological. And so okay. it's now, let me, let me ask you something, uh, uh, Professor. Um, has, from your studies and your research, has the planet ever been under these circumstances that we see now at any time in its uh, history? No, oh, sure, repeatedly. I mean, it, it certainly never had the circumstances where CO2 was produced in this quantity by any other species. I mean, CO2 has never been generated by life to the extent that it is now by us. Not, not planet. even when we had volcanoes going all over 24 hours a day all over the uh, uh, Mother Earth? Yeah, well, I didn't finish that. I mean, in terms of the amount of CO2 going up, the rate, yes, absolutely. We've done this over and over and over in the past. And every time it's happened, 15 times, there's been a mass extinction. The rate at which we are producing CO2 is very close to what we saw during these flood basalt times. And that's the point of this book, is that we've been through this before, and it's always been a catastrophe. If we continue with our industrialization at this particular point, we're going to do the same thing all over again. And trust me, it's a very unhappy, very unpretty result. The microbes take over the planet. Uh, could uh, population management maybe work hand-in-hand hand with science here? I'm talking about, well, like, getting rid of some of the people on Earth? No, I don't want to get rid of any people. I love people. Nobody's going to get rid of people. What we have to get rid of are SUVs would be a first nice step. Secondly, we've got to come up with some plan to deal with China and India because China is putting up to two to three coal-fired plants online every single week and producing electricity through the use of coal is perhaps the most, the quickest way to increase the rate of CO2 rise. Everybody deserves a great standard of living. I mean, this is a case where we have to come up with an idea where every citizen of planet Earth has a standard of living that's equivalent to 
that we can find in the richest countries now. But we have to come to that solution in a way that does not produce carbon dioxide. We've got to figure out how to get to energy sources that are not CO2 rich. And it's simple. In the hot countries, I was just spent four months in Australia. You can, in Australia, there's so much sunshine, you could put on your roof solar panels, and many people there are making money. I mean, they are exporting electricity into their, their neighborhood. It takes about 15 years of these loans to pay off your, your solar panels on your roof. But after that, if you keep that house and the next owner of that house, you've got an, a net electricity exporter. Well, there's plenty of sunny areas in this world where that should be happening, and yet we don't see it. Okay. So especially the United States is lagging, lagging in a terrible, sinful way from trying to figure out how to turn a crisis into a profit. I mean, that's what should happen now, because let's turn this into a positive, and it could be happen through technology. Okay. Uh, Professor, stay with me. We're going to go to the phones. We have a lot of people waiting to speak with you. Uh, Freedom, go ahead. You're on. Uh, yes, uh, I, I, I would like to ask Professor Ward some serious questions here because uh, for the past few months I've been hearing the, the movement to claim that the earth is just 6,000 years old and that man lives side by side with the dinosaurs. Now, there are three Republican candidates right now at, 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 at the Republican debate on CNN who believes, uh, th does not believe in evolution and believe that the world is 6,000 years old and that human beings actually live at the same time as dinosaurs. Now, Professor Ward, uh, if this type of uh, uh, nonsense is being preached to the American people, how can people like you as a professor show absolute proof that these people who believe in, 6, 000, in, in, in a 6,000-year-old universe is wrong and thanks very much. Thank you. Well, great question. In the last year, I, I very either very bravely or very stupidly went in front of a thousand people in Seattle and debated one of the heads of the intelligent design movement. Seattle, Washington is a very tech-savvy city, but nevertheless, we have what's known as the Discovery Institute, which is trying to remove evolution from our curriculum. Well, essentially, what these people are saying is that uh, the evolution of life and the formation of various aspects of life is so complex that no natural process could have done it. But they're also saying that understanding how that happened is so complicated that we'll never figure it out. So they're telling our kids, look, if a problem is hard, don't try to solve it. God did it. Move on to the next one. And once you do that, I mean, how are you going to design the technology to get us around all of these terrible catastrophes? I advocate exquisite engineering is the solution to humanity's problems right now it's conservation with engineering hand in hand conservation just by itself won't do it we have so many people we have to have better ways of getting food we have to have better ways of not using pesticides so we need to use science to get around these problems now these know nothing fools who advocate that there's no evolution Heaven help us if someone like that became president and said, oh, you know, that fight with Russia, well, it's just too complicated. God will take care of it. Is that what we want, running this country? Thank you. Okay. Let's go to line two with Vic. Go ahead, Vic. I'm here. Yes, go ahead. Hello, uh, Hisham. Thank you for getting such mind expanding professors on the show. You're welcome. I have a question about oxygen on the planet. You know, plankton are supposed to furnish more than half of the oxygen for the planet. And there's a professor out in California who says he can document there are six times more plastic in the ocean than plankton. And I'm concerned about the plankton die-off and its effect on our oxygen levels. Well, that's a great question. Thank you. It's funny that, that so many of the situations that we, we discover or think up are, are already known from movies. I love old science fiction movies. And there was a horrible or wonderful old movie with Charlton Heston uh, and Edward G. Robinson called Soil and Green, in which just that happened. All the plankton dies off. Believe me, if the plankton does die off, uh, we've got big problems. We absolutely need it to generate oxygen. The plastic aspect of things, uh, the plastic's not going to really affect plankton production per se, but where plastics hurt us is that so many plastics 
not as a bag form, but the chemicals that make them up get into the water supplies. And many of these are artificially very similar in chemical structure to human hormones. And many people are now thinking that this early maturation in boys and girls in industrialized countries, because of the plastics entering our bodies, fool our bodies into thinking that, that we are entering sexual maturity. And so you've got this early onset of sexual maturity, and of course there's lots of societal ramifications of that. So once again, it's going to take engineering. We need to replace the nasty toxic substances, such as CO2, which is simple, and such as a plastic bag, which is complex, with something better. Great question. Very good. Let's go to Canada with Ramsey. Go ahead, Ramsey. Hello, sir. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. So I have a question uh, and a comment. Uh, sir, the United States did not uh, ratify the Kyoto uh, Protocol. Uh, and my uh, second question is, what did the, why do these uh, fossil fuel companies like Exxon, Mobil, and all these big companies uh, are against the uh, global warming? Well, isn't that a great question? Um, you know, I've got a lot of friends who work in the oil industry. I was trained as an oil geologist. And I like to think that reasonable people do reasonable things, but it's almost like asking why do the cigarette companies hate laws against cigarettes? Uh, the greatest amount of greenhouse gas production taking place is coming from, from the oil company aspects of it, the cars, and they don't want their product diminished. It's crazy because we are already seeing the drop in oil production. The Hubbard curve has been reached, and China is driving the cost of gas up. That $3.25 gallon that we have in Seattle, Washington, don't know what it is where you are, um, is certainly driven by the fact that the Chinese and the Indians are now finally, and I'm, my hat's off to them, have a, a middle class that's emerging. But we have to figure out some way that we can produce synthetic fuels that are cleaner burning. And I think in this day and age, the use of coal is we've really got to figure out how to coal is going to be the most abundant hydrocarbon resource on the planet as oil disappears and yet that's going to be our destruction if we go entirely to coal if we use dirty coal high sulfur coal as is being mined in australia right now we got a huge problem so i wish i knew the solution and a great question uh, now <clears throat> you're saying that as the sun gets hotter and grows in size now, I always heard that the sun is getting cooler. Is that not the fact? You know, it's a nuclear physics question, and this is one that Dr. Brownlee ought to talk about. But what happens is the sun um, is burning hydrogen and helium, and as it does so, that the helium is through fusion, becomes more massive. Uh, the sun doesn't, because it's getting more and more massive, for some reason, which I don't know, I don't know the equations, it can't get bigger right now. So the sun is not getting physically bigger, but because there's more mass in it and these helium atoms bump into one another, they give off more energy. So the sun is increasing its energy output. And it's not till much later that it physically gets bigger, but what happens, it gets hotter. It's already one-third hotter or more energetic than it was the 4.6-something billion years ago when it formed. So um, we, it, it's taking place so slowly, it's not going to be a big problem. We've got uh, the CO2, the short-term CO2 rise is by far a much more important problem right now. Okay. Now, where would you think we are on the Earth's clock of life? Are we, what hour are we on? Yeah, good question. It really looks like the age of animals that we have is a very short-lived thing. It took us three and a half billion years to get to animals. Um, even four billion years, some people think, if animals only go back a half a billion years. The age of animals itself will be a billion years in length, so we get to 5.5, and then the sun engulfs the earth at 12 billion years. So you can think of, we got 12 hours, and it, to get to animals and humans took, it was 4.30 in the afternoon, <laughs> And we have the one hour of animals, and then we have at 12 noon, everything's dead. So you got of the 12 hours, we're at 4.6, and we're, we're halfway through our one hour of animals. Kind of sad. Okay. 
Let's go to Australia with Dr. Tobin. Go ahead, Dr. Tobin. Uh, Dr. Tilawi, good morning, I must say. It's uh, 20 to 11 here in the morning, and of course you're at night. I would like to ask your guest whether he knows uh, Professor Lance Endersby in Australia, who essentially says that climate change is nothing new, and that um, it's happened before, and uh, this, this, the, the people who go for climate change are following a political agenda. Yeah, well, I was okay. I just had Thank a you, wonderful. I had a wonderful four-month sabbatical in Australia, and uh, I've been there before, but never in Western Australia. So I actually got to live in Perth. I got to follow footy, Fremantle. It was wonderful, and I got to hear actually that professor talk on the radio. The climate change is nothing new. Climate is always changing, but what is new is that never before has there been an addition to the normal carbon dioxide coming into the atmosphere. The carbon cycle, the only new thing that's ever happened with the carbon cycle ever has been the fact that humans have perturbed it by adding extra CO2 into the atmosphere. I mean, that, that's the different aspect. Now, now, now uh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Okay, the response to, to the point that, yes, there's been climate change in the past, so what else is new, is that, sure, there's been climate change in the past. But as I'm trying to point out, and I did in this new book, 15 times, that climate change produced mass extinctions. Well, we don't want 16. And we are not in a flood basalt. We are not in the type of volcanic regime that should produce one of these mass extinctions. But simple with the fact that we are adding extra CO2 to what is the national normal input is what's causing the problem. I had a phone call yesterday, and, and tongue-in-cheek, flip, I should have been more serious, I said, look, you know, we can get out of the crisis now if all we have to do is turn off the volcanoes. Well, there's no way of doing that. I think Australia is, from what I saw, it seems to be the least populated country on the planet. There are, there are fewer people in Western Australia than any place I've ever seen. I see Australia as one of the great beacons to lead humanity because I think the environmental ethic that I saw and the common sense, I mean, there's, there's no way that you... you cannot keep looking for energy, but the, the sense that there's a way out, that through a can-do spirit, that we can combine conservation and great engineering to solve these problems that I saw in Australia, it's like nothing else I've seen on the planet. My hat's off to the Australian country. Okay. Uh, professor, uh, commentators such as, like, Rush Limbaugh, which I'm not a fan of, but I've heard him a couple of times saying that this global warming stuff is uh, hogwash. And uh, now, from where you are sitting in the scientific, um, let's call it society up there, uh, if we say that scientists who look at this as just a natural phenomena that will pass, let's say represented by the color black, and people who uh, hold views such as yours represented by color white, are, uh, and, and you are looking at both of them, are you seeing more white or more black? Well, there's a, there's a huge disconnect, and I... I I find the disconnect is somewhat analogous to we were talking about space flight. Or are you seeing those two those two colors kind of uh, uh, interlocking? Well, all my scientist friends that I know of accept the fact that rapid climate change is taking place right now. Secondly, that this climate change is being affected by humanity, and third, that rising CO2, rising carbon dioxide, causes the Earth to get hotter, just like dropping CO2 causes it to get cooler. Um, no one disputes these things, and yet even on the radio you hear people say, well, there's no connection between carbon dioxide and temperature. Well, that's nonsense. They say that this is a normal part of the cycle. It's happened before. Well, yeah, it's happened before, but each time this happened like this, it led to a catastrophe. I mean, here's, sure, it's happened before. Nobody's disputing that. But people are trying to say that this will happen and there will be no effect from it. I mean, that's a dream world. This is a huge, huge societal problem facing us. We've got to wake up. Now, when you say societal, you mean everyone in the world, or you mean us here? Everybody in the world has to wake up to this. Everybody okay. is producing carbon. Now, if, if, why, why this subject has been politicized? Well, I mean, it's obvious, because there is huge money at stake. You see, politics and money are great bedfellows, aren't they? Uh, it would cost Even at the expense of Earth? 
Well, I'm afraid so. I mean, let's, let's face it, but a company like ExxonMobil is not a person. I mean, these giant multinationals, which are populated by people and have chairmen and CEOs, but nevertheless, they almost have sort of quasi-lives of their own, and it's very much dictated by profit motive. Uh, we can see that oil company profits are higher than they ever have been, and yet we don't see, even with these gigantic profits, any sort of rebates or givebacks. We don't see. I can tell you firsthand that, that we have an enormous amount of research going into alternate sources of energy. The, the motives right now of the big multinational oil companies is to find as much oil as they can and find it now. I mean, it would be in their own self-interest to find a lot of oil and just put it away for 100 years because 100 years from now the price would be still a lot higher. That's not happening. And so it's just this rush to profits that's really... Um, well, I mean, what, what are they going to do with all this money that one day is going to be dust well, in the sun? Well, I wonder what is going on with all this money. And we have in my own, uh, my own city, Seattle, Washington, because Microsoft is here, Bill Gates' company, we have a cater. We have a huge number of what are called the super rich. And these are almost the super, super rich. And then we were, uh, my wife and I were driving home the other day, and there was a celebrity chef just saying that he makes his life out of going to people's houses, the super rich, and for many thousands of dollars, making them dinner every night. <laughs> Gourmet chef. And it's just the riches, the amount of money that these people have is almost beyond belief. And yet, on the other hand, I have students at my university, we have an ever-increasing number of kids who can no longer, the parents can't pay for college. It's gotten so expensive, they are just pushed out of it. So, uh, Professor, who is who is yeah. producing more of this CO2? Uh, is there any particular country in the world that is producing more than others? Uh, who's the culprit here? Yeah, China is the number one producer, but just by a barely. It was only in the last month or two that China exceeded the United States. So the U.S. and China are neck and neck, but India is, is getting right up there. And if we consider that Europe as a block uh, is is almost the same amount as either China and or the United States. So it is those four blocks, I think, that, that are really going to control the destiny. Japan is following, and I really think what's going to happen by next century, I think Brazil will be an area, one of the great developing countries on the planet, and they will be uh, adding into this too. And so uh, each of these economic powerhouses is culprit here. Now, uh, does eventually CO2 engulf the whole world with equivalent amounts, or is it better in, in some places than others? Oh, no, it's absolutely global. I mean, the CO2 content in one place is the same everywhere else. We measure it on a high mountain in Hawaii. I've been there at the Carbon Dioxide Observatory, and it's just a place where uh, instruments measure this all the time, and the graph is very stunning. You see this going up, 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 and there's no down, down, down at all. Okay, so it doesn't matter where you are on Earth, it's going to be, CO2 is going to affect you the same thing. It doesn't matter if you're in China or if you are uh, in the tropics somewhere. Absolutely global. Now, the effect of it temperature-wise certainly changes from place to place. Once again, the... Uh, uh, the tropical regions are not going to experience much of a rise relative to what's going on in the Arctic. It's the Arctic, the ice caps that are disappearing. Now, once again, it's not melting sea ice that has any problem for us because it melts and has no effect on sea level. It's the continental glaciers. The ice caps, the, the real players are the Greenland ice cap and the several Antarctic ice caps, most importantly the West Antarctic ice cap. When they melt, they cause sea level to rise. If all melt, sea level rises 240 feet. We haven't seen that since the Cretaceous. Now, the amount of CO2 that caused that in the Cretaceous was 1,000 parts per million. CO2 is 380 and rising at 2 ppm. We can have a Cretaceous-like condition uh, probably within 200 years at most, and some people think sooner than that. So if we get to 1,000 ppm, we will have all the ice caps melted 500 to 1,000 years after that, and we're back to the Cretaceous. Uh, professor, really why are we so world. special to live in at a point in life when uh, there is something such as this global event happening? Uh, is, it, is it because of our industry? Is that what you're saying? 
No, absolutely. Absolutely. There's nothing special going on tectonically right now. We're not seeing any flood basalt activity. We're not seeing anything that we haven't seen for the last couple of million years. So, uh, uh, Ironically, if humans hadn't come along, we would be heading back into yet another ice age, and that ice age is being formed by these same processes we talked about, this, the long-term drop in CO2. So uh, one of the callers mentioned something that I never knew, or I don't think it was uh, correct. He said some of the Republicans are saying that man lived at the time of the dinosaurs? Yeah, absolutely. Three of them said that they uh, do not believe in evolution and, and take, literally take the... Uh, so why the dinosaurs died and people didn't? Yeah, you know, great. you got to ask the Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> Good question, man. Good question. Because I thought I thought it was like dark over uh, engulfed uh, uh, the um, or smoke or whatever, and basically everything on um, on Earth died, isn't it? Well, it's not everything. What happened was the the Chicks Lube asteroid, a 10 kilometer body, hit the planet 65 million years ago. This is the only mass extinction not caused by global warming of the 15. And after that, they had what is now called a nuclear winter. We had a huge amount of dust going up, causing a long-term blackout, three months, as you said. And that produced a huge drop in temperatures. So the world at that time was very tropical, and all of a sudden it's, it's caught in darkness. And so you kill off most of the plants. You also had fallback from the body. And I, I, have, I spent the first two decades of my career working on this particular extinction. Uh, there's a lot of soot in the KT boundary layer, and this is caused by the little pieces of the Gulf of Mexico, the Yucatan Peninsula. The, the crater is 200 kilometers across. A huge amount of rock goes into space, comes back down, heated, and causes the forest to burn up. And so the dinosaurs probably died out within two or three months at most. Now, you don't think humans were sophisticated enough back then to maybe... Some of them went and lived in deep waters? No, you're sounding like a Republican. <laughs> there, was no, there was no humans back then. This was 65 million years ago. The mammals okay. at the time now, were no bigger than do you, do you see, now of course, you know, with an asteroid hitting uh, Earth, they did not have time to do anything. But do you see, uh, uh, do you see humans ever maybe having to populate the oceans and get off land? Yeah, that's a great question, and um, Don Brown and I were talking about this whole idea of will we colonize the solar system. If we talk about, a lot of people say we should colonize Mars. It would be a whole lot easier to colonize underwater on America, or I'm sorry, in this, on Earth, than it would be going to Mars. But even that, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, to, to build underwater cities is nuts. It, it would be a lot easier to colonize Antarctica and just wear nice warm coats than it would be to build underwater cities. So I, I don't see that. But let's, the other thing, let's, let's remember, when the ice caps melt, and my own point of view is that I don't think we humans will get our act together. I think we are going to cause 1,000 ppm. I think absolutely we're going to melt the ice caps. But let's look at the upside. The upside is all of a sudden Antarctica has no ice and Greenland has no ice. And so you have two new gigantic areas that if we're smart, we can turn into to our advantage. Now, the problem being is that when you ice covers a big area and disappears, the land is, is depressed. When the ice cover melts on Antarctica and Greenland, the sea will rush in. There'll be a big depression, and you'll have big central oceans in there. You can't farm an ocean. If we're smart, we'll dam the edges. We'll produce inland freshwater lakes and build gigantic farms around those. So we can take for some of the loss of land from sea level rise by colonizing and doing good work in Antarctica and Greenland. Of course, who owns Antarctica? Denmark says it owns Greenland, but you're going to see a huge political rush soon to grab Antarctica. Okay. Now, uh, do you think, is there any data out there to support that maybe man had lived in the sea before? Is there any such data out there? Uh, when I was in Australia, I was living not next to the Barrier Reef, and I was living in the sea as many minutes of the day as I could. But other than that, no, I don't think so. Okay. So the notion that human race may have started in the water, uh, there's no data to support that? 
Not that I know of. Uh, especially that, I mean, humans live in water the first nine months of their life. Is that... No, 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 no. That's, that's not nonsense. No, 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 no. Okay. Um, so, just for the uh, few minutes that we have left, uh, tell me the next... Uh, what we should expect in the next 10 years, 15 years. Any changes that we need to worry about, or let's wait until the next 50 years? Well, I think it's the, the, the really the big changes that could affect us or not uh, is the hurricane season. If the warming trends continue as projected, we should still see a whole series of uh, increased hurricanes, and, and it sometimes it gets you, sometimes it doesn't. So those are probably the worst of it. But the other thing that people, I don't know if you remember a couple of years ago, there was a horrible hot season in Europe. Uh, much of Europe Correct. did not have air conditioning. And thousands of people in France alone died from the heat, and the elderly especially. And so these heat waves are going to increase, and we're going to see enormous human mortality from the heat waves. Those will increase in number. Um, there will be disruptions in agriculture. But the next 10, the next, up to the next 50, no, it's going to be pretty much as things are now, and the collapse and tipping points are probably looming only from 50 years outward after that. Uh, uh, Professor, we have three minutes left, and I have a question, and I also have a caller, so we're going to go as quick as we can. Uh, uh, President Bush, this is more of a political question. Uh, uh, President Bush has signed on May 9th a presidential directive basically giving himself uh, dictatorial powers of uh, over uh, the, the whole federal system. Uh, and in case of a, an, an event, and one of it is like ter terrorism, but also he mentioned the environment. Uh, is, do, do they know that something is, is about to happen in the environment? That's why he signed uh, this directive? Do you know anything about that? No, and, and once again, the, the president has, has either gotten very poor scientific advice or refuses to listen to good scientific advice. But, I mean, can we be surprised at anything that's happened from this administration? His, Karl Rove is his chief scientific advisor. Well, that's pretty clear. He's chief advisor, period, on everything. That well, guy is, is brilliant. Science, science is okay, part of it. let's go to Canada. Go ahead. Hello, sir. Yes, quick. Uh, sir, my question is, um, you get, um, what do you think of uh, what Al Gore is doing regarding the uh, okay. warming? Is it all, uh, Very good. Ramsey, we don't have much time. Okay, what do you yeah, think of what Al Gore is doing? I'd love to meet the man. I think he's done more than, than anyone else to, to bring this up and that we all owe him a great debt. I think he's made mistakes. I think he's exaggerated many issues. Okay. But now, whole... now yeah. Professor, before I let you go, uh, yep. are, you, are you in any way, you are a scientist, you are a professor of science, are you in any way taking this fight politically? Uh, I have not. I think my, my political work is to talk on radio shows like this. That's all I do. Okay, so you're doing this. This is pure science that you have that you have found. I try to just I call him as I see him. I do my science, and if I'm lucky enough to get on a show like this, all I can do is express my views from my scientific findings. Very good, Professor Ward. Thank you, sir, for coming on the program, and we hope to have you back here soon. Yeah, well, call me anytime. Thank you. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen. I know this particular subject has been politicized, but there is something out there, and there is something that we do need to listen to. Uh, I think I believe what the professor had uh, given us, even though he did sound more where he stands. I mean, it was very clear where he stands politically, but uh, uh, he's an accomplished scientist. Uh, his partner, where they wrote the book together, is also an accomplished scientist with NASA. Both of these gentlemen, go look him up, Peter Ward and Donald Brownlee, and you decide. Let's clean up this world. Good night. We'll see you next Tuesday. Time on the drums. Each hit has a tail like a comet.